All right, so our final lecture on counterarguments, I want to just sort of talk over some primary things you need to be considering and in putting into your counterarguments section that you'll be turning in this coming Sunday. So earlier this week, we talked a little bit about what counterarguments are and why we use them and things like that. I just want to kind of review and throw some more samples and some other material at you to help you out here. Two very important things that you need to keep in mind, and the second part is kind of a multi-part little bit. But when you engage in a counterargument, you need to have a clear transition. I'm going to point that out to you here. When you're moving from into this new section of your paper, when you're moving away from your argument and moving to your counterargument. And the second thing is to make sure that you're respectful but clear in supporting your own argument. You are going to be engaging with points of view that might be in opposition to yours, whether that's a naysayer, a specific person or group of people, a counter-argument, which might be something from anything from the antithesis of your own thesis, to maybe questions that you feel like the audience might ask when you're done. It is meant to design in a way to help make sure that you are being respectful to outside of views that might come up or people, things that people might say in response to you, but it's also an opportunity for you to really reinforce and drive home your argument. Now, I went ahead and did a quick example here, and I want to note really the opening lines here. Some readers may contend that the criminal justice system is unprejudiced and honorable with their ruling and sentencing. Right off the bat, this is an excellent transition. Some readers may contend. It is clearly indicating that we are now moving into a phase where we are speculating on what somebody else might say. Now, what this should obviously go on to say here is it asks certain questions you'll see here. Impossible, some will say. They are actually speculating. You must be reading uh, research. You must be reading the research selectively. Then often justify the logic based on their definition of fair and conception of it. Are you who and are those who believe and argue this wrong? To a certain degree, no, but there are police officers and judges who are unbiased and believe in justice. Yet, is it necessarily true that criminal justice system is flawed? Okay, This person asks a series of questions and then before engaging in a bit of response. So they're actually playing the part of someone who might come along and ask questions and ask for further detail. Now, in addition to this example, I've got two more lengthy ones that I've attached here. All right. This one here, um, I would say that their, their, their opening line is a little flawed here. This line right here would not be what I would consider a good transition. This one right here is much better. And it opens with many critics of Miller have admitted that Dark Knight returned, and they actually even quote somebody right off the bat. That is a much stronger sentence and would have been a better starting point. This is a better example. Critics such as Grant Morrison question the nature of these superheroes in Watchmen. Again, a little fuzzy, but better. The idea here is you need to make sure you have a clear transition. Now, I provided these, and these, by the way, have multiple paragraphs for you to look at because it really isn't going to be just one paragraph. And these are sort of opening ones, but these should, this should run on for hopefully about a page and a half to two pages. You want to anticipate and use a paragraph at a time to really unpack uh, certain counter arguments. So say, for example, if you're arguing that something is a work of literature, your opening paragraph, maybe you're tackling the idea that there are some who would say it's not a work of literature. You might generally overview that, and then you might move on to a specific example. And this is something that you can stay with for multiple paragraphs. But each time you're doing so, you're going to raise a, a voice of objection, or raise a counter argument, or ask a question, you're going to attempt to look at the other opposition's point of view, but you're always going to return back to re-arguing and reasserting your own thesis position. Um, I think this one's pretty good right here. Um, when it gets down here to the idea that this, I love the fact that, that yet it is necessarily, they use some sort of terminology here. This person obviously is willing and engaging in a bit of concession, understanding that there is not a clear way for them to refute the opposition. If it's simply questions, you can answer those questions. If it's a counter argument or a naysayer, you've got to find some way to either um, oppose them, but that does not necessarily, necessarily mean that you have to be combative, okay? So I've got some more examples there. And just in case you're still struggling, I want to point out that I've got another take on all this that I posted here. 
And this comes from the Center uh, for Student Success, and it talks a little bit more about counter-argument rebuttal, and I just want to go over it with you guys, so in case any of the things I've been sharing, here's another share, okay? Talks about what a counter-argument is, where do I put a counter-argument? Um, now, they, I don't necessarily agree. I consider this to be something that comes after your, um, your, actually after your argument section. They're looking at this just in terms of essays. Now here's something, how do I introduce a counter-argument? Counter-argument in an essay has two stages. The first stage is to turn your argument, uh, turn on, your, turn against your argument and challenge it. The following list of ways to approach introducing a counter-argument templates. So here it is. Yet some readers may challenge. After all, many believe. Indeed, the key element here, and one of the things I'm going to be looking for when I look at your papers, is I'm going to be looking for that clear transition. Do I see the clear changeover from the argument to the counter-argument section? If I don't see that, that's going to be something I'm going to point to you and say, hey, we might want to clear that up. All right? um, and then, of course, it goes on through a couple of different ways. Introduce skeptical reader, cite the actual source. So this is the idea here of moving to the next step that you actually give information that comes from the opposition. Look at your argument uh, themselves for arguments for themselves for possible problems, disadvantages, alternate explanations. Okay. After introducing your counter argument, you state the case against yourself briefly, but clearly and forcefully as you can. Point to evidence where possible. Okay. And then you're going to rebut. Once you have introduced a counter-argument and you've given us the counter-argument or the question or the naysayer and their point of view, you're then, though, going to turn this around. This is very similar to what we do when we integrate a source. When I talk about integrating a source into your argument section, I talk about the fact that you introduce it, you integrate it, you cite it, and then you explain it, connecting it back to your thesis. The similar thing follows with this. You're going to introduce a naysayer or a counter-argument or ask a question you're going to, if it's a naysayer or counter argument, present us with what that position states. And then, though, you're not going to defend it in the explanation. Your chance in the explanation for you specifically is to then turn around and point out why and reinforce your own position. So you'll see here, the second stage, you can turn back to reaffirm your argument. Uh, you may consider following rebuttal taxes that fall uh, and models structuring them. Uh, quote, acknowledge, acknowledge experts. So this is the idea that you can bring in your own source material to then re refine and point back. This is also, by the way, something you can do. You can bring in more source material. Uh, redefine the no criteria of known concepts. Find agreement. This is the idea that you can concede some ground. doesn't mean necessarily that you have to become 100% against them. Um, but you can give a little ground and say, I can accept what they're saying up to this point. But here is where what I'm talking about really focuses. Something like that. Try your hand at it, okay? Pointing out faulty assumptions. They give some examples here. And then they lay out an example here, and they actually argue, give you the chance to practice. So here's the argument. The primary focus in medical end-of-life decisions uh, should be a patient consent rather than doctor intention because it is not a breach against the patient's rights if she, she, he consent to the termination of life. That's the argument being presented by somebody, okay? Primary focus in medical end of life discussion should be on patient consent. Counter argument Termini terminally ill patients are likely to be depressed and therefore unable to consent to their hastening death. So they're pointing out uh, a flaw in the logic. The argument is saying this, but they're saying, but what about terminally ill patients who maybe is not in the right state of mind? Rebuttal Depression can be managed. The relevance of depression must be made by a case to case basis. Depression does not warrant a general rule prohibiting patients from consenting and hastening death. So that's an example of argument, counter argument, rebuttal. And where we are now, we are in the process of engaging that counter argument and rebuttal. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to do the practice, but you can if you want to, just to sort of apply it to your own, or you can apply it using the one there present. Now, the last thing I went ahead and posted here, this is just something for you to start thinking about and looking at, is that we are going to begin to wrap up our paper this weekend. You're going to turn in Writing Workshop 4 on Sunday, but come Monday, Tuesday, you really need to be getting the complete paper because come Friday, uh, one of the things I'm going to be posting is Writing Workshop 5. And basically, we, that's Conclusion and Work Cited page where we're wrapping up. But I've gone ahead and included this here just because it's a nice thing to look at. In overall formatting, this is an annotated paper presented by the Owl at Purdue, and what I like most about it is how it just goes in here 
and presents you with a series of boxes and a paper and talks about the things in the formatting. It says here that the green boxes uh, contain explanations of MLA style guidelines, while the blue boxes contain directions for writing and citing an MLA. So you'll see here they have a header, heading, okay, there's differences, they to explain those. Um, it says use of personal pronouns is up to the instructor's discretion. My general discretion about that is if you're talking about something or giving a personal example, I have no problem with you using a first person, but you do want to limit it. Um, it talks here about titles and proper formatting of this. It talks a little about introduction paragraphs, thesis statements. Um, this is talking about paper organization if your paper was an incredibly long version. MLA, and then of course MLA requiring double spacing. Uh, when using headings, they even go into the idea of you're using a heading if we're not using subheadings. Um, and it talks a little bit more about headings. It gets down here to be sure to differentiate. Oh, it's more heading about headings, sorry. Uh, yeah, then let's see down here. There's an example. They get down here, they actually get down here to a block quote example, which I know some people have been talking about. Um, they talk about if we were using footnotes. It covers the whole gambit of things. Some of this not really something we need to concern about. But you'll see your in-text citations occur after the quote, but before the period. The authors are authors. Names go before the page number with no comma in between them. Okay, So some of this is relevant to us, some of it not. Um, you get a little bit further down here. This is the use of ellipses. Uh, transitions connect paragraphs. So it even shows you an example of a transition here. Uh, body paragraphs getting down here I believe it gets a little bit further down here and it actually does give us here's an example of block quotation so you can see that it talks about it not something that you have to heed all the advice on this but I wanted you to sort of see this as an additional resource for you guys to use and then talking about periods source material and then it gets down here to the conclusion which is where you'll be wrapping up soon and notes, which we don't necessarily have, but it does get into work cited. So this is something you're going to want to refer to. And I'll probably post a reminder about this in Writing Workshop 5. So you can sort of see what you need to make sure that you're taking care of in terms of getting things ready to have something on the lines of a complete draft. Maybe not a perfect draft. It's still rough. That you'll then share next week. We will do our peer review. You'll turn in your rough draft next, uh, next Friday, I believe. We'll double check that real quickly. Let's see, peer review next week. Rough draft paper will be due on April 26th. So yeah, I believe that's on Friday. Okay. And then I will revise, give you feedback, and you will turn in the final draft on May 1st, along with revisions for reports 1, 2, and 3. So that'll be crucial, but we'll talk more about that at a later date.